Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 12 of Revelation chapter 8. And we're going to be reading verses 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And I'll stop reading there. We're continuing to go verse by verse through the book of Revelation. And we've come to chapter 8. And we've seen that chapter 8 is uh, detailing God's judgment upon the New Testament churches and congregations at the time of the end. And he is using the phrase third part in order to let us know that that is the focus of his judgment. It is upon the New Testament corporate church. And we read... In verse 7, the third part of trees was burned up. And now, in verse 8, after reading that a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, we uh, looked at that in our last study, and we saw the great mountain was a representation of the kingdom of God. That is, the corporate outward representation of God's kingdom upon the earth which the churches did represent during their time period of almost 2,000 years, for 1,955 years during the church age. If anyone wanted to know anything about God, they went to church, because within the church was the Bible, and Christ was in the midst of the congregations, the congregations had the light of God. They had the truth, and it was through those congregations God was saving. But now it's the end of the church age. It's the end of that period of representing God's kingdom. So the great mountain is burning. It's under the wrath of God, burning with fire and cast into the sea and we saw that the sea can typify people, the wicked. The wicked are uh, like the troubled sea. And so God has turned the church over completely to Satan and his emissaries who are wicked people. And, and the, they are having their way with the church during this period of time of the Great Tribulation, which uh, we now know, uh, we've gone through it, is past. Well, and, and then it said at the end of verse 8, And the third part of the sea became blood. The sea here again is referring to people, but since it speaks of the third part of the sea, it's referring to people, wicked people, within the congregations. And we know from, uh, I, I've been referring to Isaiah fifty-seven twenty. the wicked are like the troubled sea, and also from the epistle of Jude, which is found right before the book of Revelation, it says, and I'm going to read from verse 11 just to set the context, in Jude, verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are, without water, carried about of winds. Trees, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Now this is all describing um, false prophets, those that are going the same way that Cain and Balaam and Korah went, those that had an outward relationship to, of some degree with God, 
but they never truly became saved. That's what makes them false. And then God says of these in verse 13, they're like raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So the false prophets or a professed believer who's not a true believer is as a raging wave of the sea. And, and God here in Revelation 8 verse 8 is saying the third part of the sea became blood. This, this sea that identifies with the wicked, the unsaved people that populate the, the churches all over the world and especially their leaders, the, the church authorities, the rulers of the congregation, they have been turned to blood because blood indicates the wrath of God. The judgment of God is upon them. Well, let's, let's move on into verse 9 of Revelation 8, and we'll see that this picture is continuing. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of ships were destroyed. Now God just finished telling us the third part of the sea became blood, and it's almost um, a, a natural result that, of course, if the sea is, is turned to blood, then the third part of the creatures in the sea would die. And that's what we're reading here. And really, even as the sea typifies the unsaved within the congregation, so too does the third part of creatures. But let's look at a few verses in Exodus chapter 7. Again, we're going back to the plagues that the Lord brought upon Egypt. In Exodus 7, I'll, I'm going to read several verses beginning in verse 17. Thus saith Jehovah, In this thou shalt know that I am Jehovah. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood, and the fish that is in the river shall die. And the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, as Jehovah commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now here God is striking the waters of Egypt and turning them to blood. And as a result, the fish in the river dies and the river stinks. And the, the word stink really leads us to uh, what was said of Lazarus in the Gospel of John in the New Testament when it was pointed out to the Lord Jesus Christ that he had been dead four days already and he stinketh. The death brings forth a stinking savor. And when the water was turned to blood, the fish could no longer live. They could no longer exist in that kind of water, and they died. Uh, actually, when we think of our verse in Revelation 8 that speaks of the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, we, we realize, well, for the most part, uh, the overwhelming uh, ma vast majority of creatures in the sea are fish. And here God, in striking the waters of Egypt, turning them to blood, is emphasizing the death of fish. We also read 
in um, a single verse in Psalm 105 that uh, is discussing this plague that, that the Lord brought upon Egypt. In Psalm 105, verse 29, he turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. The, the turning of the water into blood and the killing of the fish go hand in hand. The, the fish could not survive this judgment of God. Now, uh, we've discussed this before. We've seen this figure used before of fish representing men. You know and um, are aware that the Lord Jesus called fishermen to be his disciples saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And, and that is the type that God is using when we read of fish in the sea. And we'll just go to one more verse in Habakkuk concerning uh, fish anyway. In Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk 1, and um, let's see, it goes... Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, H-Z, H-Z. Habakkuk 1, and I'll read from verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? and makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Now here God is um, giving us one of those scriptures where he defines a, a spiritual meaning. In verse 14, and makest men as the fishes of the sea. So there is the, the spiritual definition of fish. Uh, we, we can't say that that would fit every instance in the Bible where fish is found, but uh, certainly we must consider that when God is re speaking of fish, that spiritually he is referring to men. And that's uh, exactly what is happening in Revelation 8 in verse 9. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And, and he's speaking of men in the churches. And so they're identified as the third part. And notice also the, the word creatures. Third part of the creatures which were in the sea. And of course a fish is a creature in the sea. But let, let's look at this word itself in the epistle of James, in James chapter 1. It says in verse 18, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And th this is a very interesting verse because God is joining together the word first fruits with the word creatures. And we know that the first fruits is a word that identifies with the church age, the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14 are called the first fruits unto God. They typify all those that were saved during the church age from 33 AD until its close in 1988. And, and so as God is linking the word first fruits with creatures, we can see how, how that relates to our verse because the first fruits would have been found within the New Testament church. That's where the first fruits were gathered. That's where these creatures are found. Creatures uh, that, that are spoken of as sea creatures, but, but we know that this is just a type and a figure referring to people. The third part of the creatures which were in the sea, 
and had life died. And uh, th- this is um, uh, an important statement. It's very significant that God points out to us that these creatures, the third part of the creatures in the sea, had life. They once possessed life because it's, it's said in uh, past tense, had, they, they have somehow lost their life. And so we can know absolutely that, um, that this cannot be talking about God's elect. Remember, as, as we did see that the third part in the Old Testament repeatedly identified with the elect, well, we can know that it's not the elect in view in here at all because these um, creatures, the third part of creatures, had life. And, and they lost their life. That's why it says they died. They no longer possess life. Now, what does the Bible tell us? When someone becomes saved, truly saved, not, not um, church saved, not saved by um, profession, by, by words of men, by belief of men, that, that never saved anyone. We're saved only by the power of God, by the act of God upon us. And, and as he creates a new heart and a new spirit within us, we have no power to say a few magic words like, I accept you or I believe. And then, and then um, as they say in the magic world, presto change, oh, suddenly we're a child of God. That never has happened. God has not given that kind of power to men. But it takes the word of God to create as he is the creator. And and that's why David in Psalm 51 was crying out to the creator, create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Not not let me do it myself, but God had to do the work of creating. And when God did that work, when he saves an individual, when God uh, gives that person a new heart and soul, a new resurrected spirit, well, that's it. They're, They're born again. They live. They have the gift of eternal life that they will never lose. If anyone could ever lose the gift of eternal life, well, what would that mean? It would mean that what they had received was not eternal life. It was conditional life, and, and life for a time perhaps, but it was not eternal, because eternal means forever and ever. Adam and Eve receive conditional life. You will live and continue living as long as you obey me and do not eat the fruit of that tree. But they disobeyed and they had life, but then they died. And this is what God is saying here of the third part of creatures in the sea had life, but died. And why does God say that? Well, because when individuals take upon themselves the name of Christ in Christian, we have the name of Christ. When we say, I am a Christian, and, and all the churches uh, were populated with Christians as people entered into the congregations and they began taking the name of Christian. And when you say you're a Christian, you're saying, I am born again. I am saved. I have a new heart and spirit. I have life. And so God uh, basically takes people at their word with that. Of course, then uh, when people do not measure up to that um, high standard of being a Christian, and, and how do you measure up? Well, you have to have a heart that Uh, that does the will of God perfectly, that is without sin, an ongoing desire to do the will of God. 
because that's the nature of the heart that God gives his people. And if you lack that heart, it can be you can be sure it's certain that you will not measure up. And and so when people fail to measure up, God um, indicates it is as though they lost life. Or, or look at it another way, with the parable of the Lord who forgave his servant. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, and it says in uh, verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. Well, there it is. It's as though he has life. He has salvation. But then the same servant goes out and he does not forgive his fellow servant a a much, much smaller debt. So that when the Lord who had forgiven him much heard, we read in verse 32, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. You see how God uses the belief of the individual. Okay, you you say you're a Christian, and therefore that means all your sin is forgiven, and that would mean you live. And, and God actually speaks of those who say they live or Uh, Actually, uh, it's more accurately put, they have a name that they live. Back in Revelation 3, verse 1, towards the end of the verse, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And and God goes along with that very well. All of you you people who profess to be Christians, uh, therefore it is as if I have forgiven you, now I expect you to be forgiving of others from the heart. And since the heart is still desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, because no change has ever taken place, that will not happen. And and so it, it is as though God at the end turns around and says, you failed to live up to the standard that I have set for my children and therefore I will judge you. But the truth is, they never had become saved. They never had their sins forgiven. They never had a new heart or new soul. And and this is the idea here in Revelation 8, verse 9, And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. They They had always been dead. They were never spiritually alive, but in their profession, in their belief, and and as far as God viewed them, all right, they had life. But now judgment has come upon the church, and all of these individuals now die. The wrath of God is upon them, and the third part of the creatures die. It, it It's really an awful judgment that God is describing. We're reading of trees and and uh, the third part of the sea and third part of creatures and and it's it's removed really. It, it's um, taking objects and using them as types and figures, but God is talking about men and women and children, families. He's talking about people that we know and 
And so it is a grievous thing. It's an extremely sorrowful thing. And this is one of the reasons why Jeremiah the prophet, who God had given much revelation to concerning Judah's judgment, which in turn typified the judgment that would come upon the churches at the time of the end, was such a sorrowful prophet, known as the weeping prophet, because it was such a a sad thing that he had to pronounce these judgments upon his own people. Likewise, it, it is not a pleasurable thing for the child of God, Uh, to declare what God is saying in his word. But we must declare what God tells us. We're only reading what the Bible says, and we're we're following God's method for coming to truth. And and so we, we look at other places where God mentions sea, and where he mentions blood, and where he mentions fish and creatures, and 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 so forth, and we see that this is what the Bible is teaching. There is no uh, avoiding it, no escaping it. God is describing an awful time known as the Great Tribulation, and a time when judgment begins at the house of God. And we have uh, witnessed this time. We we have been eyewitnesses to the words of the Bible coming to life. We have seen the wrath of God poured out upon our modern day church, the church at the end of the world, and they have been forsaken and they have been judged and destroyed by the word of God. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over PalTalk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.